Hughes has a her own listserv of students, um, families that have students with IEPs. And I would say another way would be to also send out through her listserv. We don't we don't get communications very often from Dr. Hughes. So when we do, I think parents take it very seriously. And I just want to say that when we as SEAC send out a survey, if we send it out, we get like 20 responses. If Dr. Hughes sends it out, we get 150. So just just a thought. Great, thank you so much for that. Terrific. Yes, thank you for the suggestion. All right, uh, Mrs. Meyer, if you'd like to continue. I, I happily will do that. And I, you know, to um, Dr. McEwen's point and Ms. Musella's point, I didn't put the charts up because we're gonna go through this next slide. And I figured enough data for, for, for today. Um, Dr. Arnoff, if you would be kind enough to share the presentation. Okay, um, this slide presentation will be on our, our district website. Um, all of the links are live. I encourage everybody to use that Back to School Rhode Island website, which I've linked here. There is a lot of really great data in there, especially in the need to know section where it has um, videos that folks can look at from Dr. Bromage and facilities and health and safety. Um, even it has um, current um, infection rates or positive rates at each district. So that, that's just a great um, resource for you. Next slide, please. For the health and safety update, and in, in, in this presentation, I just mainly did um, what is new um, so that um, I don't repeat Mrs. Wilson's picture here because I think that most um, felt a primary force, frankly, in ensuring that we have the proper safety protocols in place. So what is new is, you know, and being implemented at the state level is the COVID testing for pre-K-12 Department of Health. Um, and um, certainly in conjunction with the nurses, they are in regular contact protocol that Rhode Island Department of Health has um, laid out for all of us. So the next link there is the use all of the time with determining how we operate every day. And then the next what is expected of school-based testing in case in school Rhode Island? I just wanted to remind everybody that you know, staff, everybody has been great. They really have. Um, it is something to celebrate for all of us. And then the other piece, um, which isn't seen clearly on this slide, but you can see it when it's on the website. Daily attestation for in-person students and staff, there are two different uh, ways in which they report their attestation is required. Um, so that inf the link is there, that information is on the website. Every day before a child comes into school, the attestation form needs to be filled out. And, and um, next slide, please. So with regard to facilities, and I, I think these signs are so great. Do you see this Hannaford Hawks rule? Um, I'm seeing them on people's lawns too, celebrating birthdays. So I think it's a great picture. Um, the fire marshal is in the process of visiting schools. He hasn't been to all the schools as yet, but he has spoken directly with, um, I know he was in Mrs. Crudale's school um, and he's spoken with principals and looked at um, how the desks are arranged in classrooms and, and made recommendations. We purchased 100 box fans and those have been distributed to schools. Um, Mr. Wilmarth also purchased 26 portable HEPA filter air purifiers. They are going into rooms that um, are deemed to have, you know, the least amount of air exchange, although in all of our, our classrooms we have the um, required or, or accepted rate of air exchange. Um, at, the, at East Greenwich High School in the room that the nurse uses, the assessment and isolation room, 
special air purifiers were installed because there's a belief this week we have purchased and they are coming in or they are, are in these desks um, in, in cold. They're on the individual desks, for example, in the Catholic world. In the contractors with the cleaning and disinfection are doing our areas safe. And I just, with regard to our walkthrough, our district walk. Through, I wanted to remind everybody that um, this was a letter the missioner in Fonte Green saying that, um, you know, they did information from us that we met the criteria. We had some feedback, um, but um, we didn't have any areas. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. I, you know, when I started to do this slot, really needed to be said here, and really what needs to be said for this district. It really is nothing less than remarkable. I mean, we are in the point before, you know, even with the technology, which normally would have taken years. And what what are they doing? They're working hard. They're being adaptable. They're resilient. Um, I am so heartened to see the way they are supporting one another and that to the teaching and learning and well-being of all EG students. And what are our students doing? They're doing the same thing. They're working hard. They're being adaptable. They're help. They're being resilient as well. And they're understanding, especially of the technology and helping us to work through it. Um, I have had the pleasure of speaking to them especially our distance learners when I get to visit a classroom and, and um, it's, it's nothing less than a pleasure. You know, and, it, and what's so important for all of us to, to embrace at this unusual time is that, um, you know, it's so very hard for um, an educator to um, be the, be to which always who is achieving for excellence to try to navigate all of this. It's not easy. And, and I've said to them, give yourself a little bit grace as we go through this together. Um, but I wanted to take this moment to recognize them. Technology, as I said, continues to have challenges, but it really is improving. Um, I was able, to, I've been able to see many classrooms with many meetings going on um that are still um that are being quite successful chromebooks i just put in here still scheduled feeding i got a response from our distributor that's saying um that's indicating a cautious approach to that october delivery so dr arnoff and i will might have to be looking at other options options at this point there are some so you may have to take advantage of that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, the morning routines are going really well. We're getting better at it, altogether getting bad, better at it. I wanted to thank Officer Rafferty and Sergeant Carter um, for helping us make these morning routines work very well. You know, safety is our very first priority and, you know, adhering to those safety morning and afternoon routines at each school is really important so that we keep everybody safe. You know, and as we anticipate potentially more students coming into our buildings and, and, and recognizing that, you know, our bus transportation is only a limited capacity at approximately 30%, it means we have a lot more cars coming into our schools. And everybody is working really hard to do that. Um, with regard to Aramark, I, I put this little uh, picture in here. So, we, you know, meal free meals or meals are available to all of our students for any child or students of federal government um, initiative and for our distance learners and there are even weekend meals available so the website has you know you can get some more detail on the website specific to the, the meal program if you want to have more information okay next slide I, I just put this slide in here as a reminder because we have you know the education Education Operations Center available to us and, and how they will help us as we begin to navigate through the school year. 
that, you know, they, they, in fact, um, I learned today that they will be uh, contacting individual principals and, and walking through buildings and asking principals what type of support they may need. They are, they really are responsive. So it, it was a, it's a great resource for us to have as a district. Okay, where are we? We are in week three of our staggered start, and this is just a, um, a picture of the week that we are in. So we continue with our staggered start through October 2nd um, with our elementary students in um, K-5, you know, 50% and our high school and middle and high and our, um, you know, our life skills students and students schedules specific to their learning and their needs. So next slide. Uh, and the elementary opening, what does a full opening, full in-person opening scenario mean for elementary attention to the highlighted um, text in the bottom about 825? You know, at the elementary level for a full in-person scenario, students are in stable pods and they are um, to spend most of their day together. Each class and pod will be outside with two elementary classes. There should be four feet of different di distance between and among every other pod. If a middle school functions like a high school then and cannot maintain stable groups, then the high school guidelines may be used instead. Just an important note. So next slide. Fifty percent of the students of the whole high school and middle school population can be present in person at any one time. And then it talks about groups to person is in a full in-person scenario between elementary and middle and high. Next slide, please. This is the direct guidance from um, the frequently asked questions referenced on page six. The guidance notes that six feet of physical distance should be maintained. The answer to this in that guidance, and, and I, I do want to be clear that any document that has been put out by RIDE has been done in um, with the Rhode Island Department of Health. They have written this in together, written this together. This time there's not a minimum number of feet of physical distance that must be maintained. Six feet is to reduce spread between individuals. Uh, when planning of students and adults are able to maintain a six foot distance apart, then additional mitigation efforts should be used. Face covering, cleaning space, supplies, not facing one another. And the spacing should be as close to six feet as possible. And then um, the bottom text is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. In many school settings, six feet between students is not feasible. Evidence suggests that, that spacing as close to three feet may approach the benefits of six feet space, particularly with face covenant coverings. So I, I wanted to, to recognize that. And, um, you know, I wanted to let the school um, an email exchange with Dr. Ranny and Dr. Silversmith prior to this evening's meeting to just, um, you know, reiterate and hear back from them that they continue to support this guidance that has come out of the Rhode Island Department of Health and the CDC, obviously. Um, and they certainly confirm that. I did also have a conversation with the Rhode Island Department of Health myself yesterday. Next slide, please. So all of our elementary classrooms and each of the principals have gone in and measured them have between four and six feet between and among students with current in-person enrollment and taking into consideration of distance learners to allow for six feet, six feet of space when masks are off. That is a requirement um, when, you're, when you're not masked. And then next slide. So here's my 
the recommendation for um, a full, you know, our full in-person opening. I have created a, a calendar for the month of October. Um, we be, would begin to switch on the week of August, uh, August, October 4th to a K5 switch. But October 5th will be an, an asynchronous day. We will maintain that asynchronous day for the whole district and then begin on the Tuesday, um, October 6th with all in, and then we, uh, we uh, maintain the current 612 schedule that, that we have. Uh, it's time to prepare one more day before we bring all students in. And it also creates some consistency for families, because if you really look at um, the Mondays in October, the following Monday is Columbus Day. The following Monday is the state PD day where everybody is asynchronous in the state. So the first three Mondays would help with those schedules. And um, one other date of note is October 14th. That will be the SAT day. So in order to administer the SAT day with a whole um, class in, grades nine through 11 will be distance learners on that day. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Mrs. Meyer, uh, for all the work that went into your recommendation this evening. Um, I, I have a question. I'm just going to start with one. I have I, ha I have several, but I'll just ask one and then open it up to other members of the committee. Uh, this one is is a. Um, this one is actually not about the schedule, but you uh, you emphasized how the attestations are required daily. And I know there have been some questions about what the protocols are if um, if the attestations are not completed. And I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about how the district is following up with um, guardians of yeah. students yeah. who have not submitted them. So we are able to see in Aspen because we've created a field set who has not submitted those. And so at the school level, the secretaries and the nurses are working together to reach out to those families. We are not, as you know, by the Rhode Island Department of Health guidelines, you know, able to, um, you know, we can't eliminate or prevent students from coming into the building for not filling them out. But it's important that parents do that every day and make it very, every part of their daily routine. Thank you. I'll go to Ms. Powell. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you so much, Mrs. Meyer. I appreciate all of the great information as always. Um, not surprisingly, I have several, <laughs> several questions about this. Um, and the first one's a little bit broad um, because I know in working with you and the reopening steering committee, as we were trying to come up with plans for reopening, um, there were scenarios we didn't contemplate. Um, and some of those had to do with waiting for expected you know, additional federal and state funding to come. Um, and so, we never, once our budget process was over, we never really went back to the town or considered doing that for additional funding. We looked in our own reserves, we looked in our capital reserves, we looked to the bond um, because we kept hoping we were going to get some more support and we still don't have a state budget. We still have no federal legislation. Um, and so my question here is, we have been doing the very best we can with what we have. And I wasn't sure if perhaps you thought it would be helpful at this point for this body to perhaps meet with the town council to request additional funds to do things like hire more teachers or find more space if we thought that would add any additional value or safety, um, you know, as other districts and their states have done. Mostly to keep class sizes smaller because as you mentioned, our teachers are concerned about their health. And while we have a lot of great data about kids, especially kids under 10. Um, our teachers aren't under 10 and they do still have these concerns. And while we are in a much better position uh, with our physical facilities than we had originally thought we would be, um, I didn't know if you thought maybe there was more we could do that we hadn't done yet um, to make that better. Or if at this point that is not, not to hold up reopening, but as we work through it to continue to make it safer. Um, 
So that was my first question. And, and thank you for that question, Ms. Powell. I mean, I would certainly say that I would never hesitate to consider every option before us and, you know, every opportunity to improve whatever it is that we do. So, um, you're, but you are correct in our reopening planning. It isn't something that we envisioned at the time. We just, we kept hoping. We had our fingers crossed. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, you know, that was um, my first. My second is also logistical. So we have about four to five feet in around students with our current class. But as we know, distance learners, you know, we are, um, we care about families and their needs and we're not always super rigid when it comes to that, which I think is a, a benefit in our community. Um, but those numbers are, could constantly be in flux, the number of kids in a classroom, especially since we have continuous enrollment often throughout the year. So um, is there, a plan at this point once we're all in to maintain that amount of space that we currently have if enrollment changes or increases um so we would have to get below the three feet yeah so we can't get below the three feet we can never get below the three feet we would not be in, in compliance and that that has been very, very clear from the department of health so should there be a change and you you know, in our, in our, you know, the enrollment has been a little bit in flux. There's no doubt about it. Um, and you're right. We do care about our families and our students. Um, we would have to make provisions. I mean, we have contingency plans in our mind that we've already spoken about. If we have to utilize the cafeteria space in some of our buildings, which are not being used right now, um, but we could never, that we is. could never go below yes. three feet and, and i'm and well, i don't even want to go below I, the fourth I, i'm right there with you know. you. um <laughs> so that was that and um my third is also technical it relates to the walkthroughs um that i was fortunate enough to be part of and at the risk of mr wilmarth never speaking to me again <laughs> one of the questions that was brought up was we have non-alcohol based hand sanitizer it's a fire code thing. It's what the schools always have. But the um, the National Guardsmen who were with us were not sure whether or not we should actually have the alcohol based on hand. And I didn't know if we ever followed up with. We got that. an email today. Oh, okay. What do we and do? I, and I I will follow up with that with you because I haven't read it clearly, and I don't want to go back to that. But I chuckled when I saw the. The subject line that it was said hand sanitizer from the that detox. They <laughs> that I remembered. That because, <laughs> and then um, my last is a little more um, policy or I guess philosophical based. Um, I know that there is a lot of support in the community for us to go back um, full time, even with some of the health and safety concerns we still have. So we have done an excellent job of trying to mitigate as many as are within our control. I think it's really important that we can continue to offer like a robust and an equitable real distance learning option for any families that choose it, not based on specific requirements, as long as there are still so many unknowns about this pandemic and the environment that we're in. I really do feel that that is our responsibility and I would not feel right voting to to reopen fully if I thought that would mean that we would lose that or that those students would somehow be marginalized or receive an education that is less than um, especially since just recently the state did roll out its virtual academy decision and it is only for medically fragile students or for students in districts that that are so impacted by COVID that they don't have like real other options. And uh, so that to make a commitment to do that for as long as this environment is with us so that families really feel like they have a real choice, um, that it's not send your kids into an environment you don't feel is right or have to homeschool them. I think, um, so I would ask you whether or not like this district is ready to make that commitment to our to our families. As long as there's no law or executive order that says we can't, 
um, that we'll do everything we can to provide that. Yeah, and I will tell you, of course we would, right? And of course we, we're obligated to do that, but obligated is a bad word. We are morally obligated to do that is a better word or two words. But um, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how hard our teachers are working try to, trying to make this work and make it be valuable time. And the other thing to, to be mindful of, Ms. Powell, is that, um, you know, I, I think it will be a regular occurrence where we have staff and students that have to quarantine. And when they are quarantined, they will be engaging as distance learners, assuming they are not sick. Sick is a different story, but if you if you have to quarantine, then you'll be you know you engage in your learning um, remotely. Thank you. You're welcome. Those are all. I'm going to squeeze in another question, and then I'll go to Ms. Musella. Uh, my question is one is just a confirmation. So um, the the all in at the elementary school uh, maintains the asynchronous Mondays or does not only for well. It it does for the state. Right. So for all PD other days, days we would uh, we would be five days in at the elementary school level, with the exception of October the first Monday. With the, October the exception of the first Monday. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and um, the other question that I have, uh, um, well, these are these are connected. Uh, one is. Um, Again, this is just a question that I'm hearing. Is there any scenario uh, that students would be able to go full in person even four days a week? Is that something that's being discussed at the state level or simply not at this time given the, the, the pandemic? Um, certainly not being discussed at the state level. I mean, it, the only way you can do it is um, with stable pods. So what does stable pods mean for a middle and a high schooler? A high schooler is almost impossible to do that because those students would stay in a classroom all day and their choices of courses would be completely limited to the group of kids that they are with. So that was part of our thinking in the beginning when you know we were looking at our reopening plan, would that even be a reasonable option or fair, frankly, to our students? And our middle school, you know, does not have stable pods. I would say that, you know, there's always the opportunity to look at the way that kids, our students come into school and how we would use all of the days, if there's a way to look at that differently. But we maintain that, you know, we would, um, you know, at the at this semester level was where we might, or semester point where we might have an opportunity to think about something differently. Unless something drastically changes with health guidance. Lines. And I just wanted to give you a chance to articulate that again because I think there has been some confusion and it's connected to my next question and then I'll, I'll move to Ms. Usela uh, and save my other question for later. But um, it, it's really about the value of the asynchronous Mondays from, uh, from the district's perspective. Um, if we are going to maintain those moving forward at the middle and high school level, um, just a, a re-articulation about why those additional asynchronous Mondays um, have been determined to be yeah, a value. Um, I'm happy to answer that question. You know, as you think about, as we've talked about, you know, throughout this presentation, and I complete, I continue to remind everybody, I mean, at asking our teachers and um, to be able to teach in-person students, teach um, regular distance learning students, and then teaching the, you know, the other 50% um, is a remarkable allow for that professional learning that help them to collaborate and, and, you know, be able to plan really for three different groups coming before them. So it's really about trying to help to ensure that every student, whether they're in person or distance learning, has the best possible educational experience and those asynchronous Mondays yes, help us do. to be able to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Misella, thank you. I'll and uh, Mrs. Meyer, thank you for that really comprehensive update. Um, as always, I, I appreciate all the information and I'm going to try to be organized with my questions. Um, just sort of um, piggybacking on what Mrs. Ms. Mark was just asking. Um, and Ms. Powell, so 
um, distance learning will continue for a segment of our student population, and that's pre-K right. through 12, correct? And where we don't have uh, dedicated distance learning classes and if some teachers, then elementary and at all levels, teachers at all levels will continue to have to teach. Right. Periodically. The difference, yeah. the, the, yep. the difference is that because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you also sent, um, you know, at my request, at our request to break down of the elementary classrooms, and I just really appreciate that detail too. It's open, but um, as I can so, get it if you need to ask me a question. I'm sorry. So, so for most of for for all the element for the elementary classes, what we're talking about is mostly instead of the hybrid approach, where an elementary teacher will conceivably be teaching half of their class in person and half virtually, what that will shift to for most elementary classes is they'll teach most of their classes with a handful synchronously. So they'll still be teaching the same way. The difference is that more people will be in their classroom and fewer people will be online. At the same time for the elementary level, we're proposing, you're proposing to send pre-K through five back in full time, five days, except for statewide with the, with, that we just carved out. So my bigger question is, because I just anecdotally asking around, I haven't seen a survey, I suspect that elementary teachers are strug maybe struggling the most with the hybrid scenario, certainly with the distance, but it's different. You've got a different population of kids, they're not as independent. So I'm concerned, one is what type of, are, have we been using these asynchronous Mondays for professional development? And if we take that away from our elementary teachers, are we leaving them with less support and marginalizing our distance learners who are part of the hybrid environment? That's my big concern. And it's sort of, it, it, it sort of speaks to what Ms. Powell was talking about. I'm, I'm very concerned because a lot of the feedback is hybrid is terrible, distance learning is terrible. I mean, I'm exactly exaggerating of course we've gotten a lot of feedback some is not as as harsh as that but the but the push is to why can't we get our kids in full time all the time distance learning doesn't work for the little ones well that's fine but are we going to marginalize the ones that really do have to distance learn thank you uh Mrs. Meyer do you want to do you want to address that and then I'll go to Dr. McEwen yeah I mean it's a fair question that that um Ms. Busella is asking um, you know, we are prioritizing our youngest learners. As you know, we tried um, to create dedicated classrooms, which is, you know, ideally, but, you know, what's important to know is that I mentioned to Ms. Powell, too, is every teacher is at some point is probably going to have a distance learner, even if they don't, even if they have you know, not, you know, even if they don't have any remote learners at this point, because the, the conditions that we exist in. Um, but we, we prioritize the in-person for five days. I, I do appreciate the question, though. Well, my question, the larger question really is, and I'd written this down before the, the additional, the other questions from my colleagues is, what are we doing to support our teachers? in terms of professional development, because what I'm hearing and seeing and partly experiencing is that there's more support that's needed. And we all know how hard our teachers are working and how hard our faculty and staff and administrators, um, that doesn't mean that, I, and it just means I think I think there's more support that's needed or any support that's there. We certainly want to, don't want to take it away. Yeah. Uh, by removing all of the asynchronous Mondays, but I'm all for getting all of our kids back as much as we possibly can. But there's still going to be that that distance element, and I, I don't know. I, I just don't know that they even now maybe feel that they have enough support. The teachers, that is. And, and I can tell you that um, Mrs. Ms., Mrs. Mr. Pedraza had um, the professional learning committee meeting today, so um, he met with that group. And he is using, he has used, we, he and I discussed this today, the feedback from the survey, the faculty survey about what folks are interested in need. 
Um, but I, I guess I would say thank you so much for you know you know your support of our teachers. And, and this is unprecedented. They're really on the front lines. I mean, certainly yeah. nursing staff, but they're the ones who are actually physically delivering that education to my kids, to all of our kids. And everybody is saying, wow, we appreciate them so much. Our administrators are saying, hey, you know, we need to give them a shout out. We also need to make sure that we give them all the support that they need. And I'm, I'm concerned that, that I, I want to make sure that you have our support in making sure that that happens. My other question is, and this will probably come up in the discussion about uh, in a later agenda item about maintenance of effort. Um, you know, it occurred to me in the last week or so, or the last couple of weeks, it's occurred to me way before that, and I've emailed about that, but we as a body have never actually asked the town council for additional funds. And I'm not sure why this, and uh, you know, we understand that the town doesn't have money, so we assume they don't have money, but it's still a conversation, a public conversation that has to happen. We have that obligation to ask for it. The town council can say, we don't have money and here's why. But that's a conversation that needs to happen in public. So I, again, I I appreciate how hard everybody is doing that we have to say. Thank you. So thank you for that, Ms. Musella. Um, I am going to go to Dr. McEwen and then to Dr. Quinn, but I just want to say, Ms. Musella, um, we we I, I agree. We need to put this on the agenda. I I think you know it, it's it's simply been because we have been awaiting the state adopting a budget and what's happening is the timeline for that keeps getting pushed out and so it's really a discussion um that um that I, I, you know that certainly i can have with mrs meyer we all can have and we can have collectively as a body about the timing of approaching uh, approaching the town um clearly if the if, if we are delayed much longer um we'll, we'll have no choice if if a budget is adopted and there is a significant shortfall um clearly there will be no choice but to go to the town but i think the primary reason we haven't had that discussion yet is because there was an expectation that a budget would be adopted and that timeline continues to get pushed out so i agree with you it's an important conversation i appreciate have that and i just also want to point out i just want to sort of read Iterate kind of our collective request, and there was some discussion. We really do need, I think, it's appropriate to ask for sort of an updated, regular kind of COVID fiscal impact statement. Um, I, and I don't know. I'm hoping that might come up in the next agenda item uh, yes, because that's it, related to finance. So I just want yeah, to put that out there. hundred percent. Um, that's actually planned for the very first agenda in the month of October um, is when we discussed having a, a financial update. So it's a perfect opportunity for us to be able to have that discussion. So I'm gonna go to Dr. McEwen and then to Dr. Quinn. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanna say how wonderful it is to be part of a school committee that is all focused on the best interests of students and teachers in the community. It's all the questions that get asked and, and the probes and the pushes are all uh, for the good of this community. and. Um, it, it's really just heartening. And so to follow on that, um, both Ms. Musella and Ms. Powell have raised some really important points about um, really some equitable conditions for distance learners and, um, and equity for our teachers and the resources and the support that we give them. And so, you know, as I looked at the numbers of distance learners, and I just, I shot a quick note to Mrs. Meyer, I don't expect an answer about this, um, I'll just say that certainly as a school committee member, I would be willing to entertain any um, line item discussions around uh, additional teachers or long-term subs that might allow us to have dedicated distance learning classrooms as we were able to have in some buckets, even, if, and I've said this before, even if that meant maybe doing some multi-age classrooms, I think there would be teachers who might take that and we could still have actually a very, very robust um distance learning environments if that was that was done the right way and i have no doubt that our, our teachers um I, I truly believe they possess the creativity to make that work uh, and so i you know i know that i'd love to see if we could consider options like that um i had the opportunity i think you all know from the uh, the superintendent's update she had offered us uh, tours to see uh, how the classrooms were set up and I was able to see them with teachers and students and um, completely agree with you, Ms. Musella, that uh, it is it is tough for our teachers to have 
little ones um, at home and some in the class. And we were doing that because of the hybrid. But to maintain that, to have teachers be able to, to move and simulate things um, would be, a, a, I think, a burden on them. So if we could, if we can work on ways to mitigate that, I'd really appreciate it. And um, I so appreciate your concerns about, Ms. Marcella, about um, professional development for our teachers in that time. And I trust that uh, it's, it's heartening to know that there's a professional learning committee and Mr. Pedraza um, is addressing that. So I think I think those were my, my major comments. Um, and again, some of that goes into the fiscal that we'll be talking about. Uh, I do know that there is a grant that came out from Riot, but that may just be for day-to-day -day sub relief and not long-term sub relief. But, but you know, maybe it's a crack in the door. So uh, I really, um, I really appreciate that. And again, just having been in the, those classrooms and watching, we had a principal teaching because a teacher was that teacher trying to you know get his kids in breakouts and I think they're all going to find their stride but we want to make sure that we give them the grace and space to do that bus learning experience sometimes that's going to mean a little bit less is more so that everybody can take a collective breath. Thank you for that Dr. McEwen. Dr. Quinn? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I just wanted to uh, reaffirm what uh, Ms. Michelle, well, really um, everyone who's spoken up so far has, has said about uh, our commitment to providing uh, uh, you, Ms. Meyer, and the teachers and the district staff with whatever resources, whatever, uh, whatever they need. Um, to allow them to, you know, utilize their skills and their creativity and their, uh, you know, willingness to think of it that we're facing. And uh, I also want, I think it should be acknowledged that um, they are being asked to risk their health in, in every day in their job now. And um, I think that's, Reflected in the fact that uh, that what your information is surveyed, it fits or you know somewhat worried about their health, and I I think that's entirely legitimate, and I think they should be. Yeah, I, I think we should be grateful that they're willing to do that because none of this would work if they weren't. Um, so, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plain. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I can't match all your thanks and great comments and great questions. Dr. McEwen said that and I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Quinn. Gratitude. Perhaps we add that to the daily attestations <laughs> uh, because that that's warranted. Yeah. Um, I, we, we have to make it clear because that that um, in our in our vote, if the committee decides to vote for, uh, consistent with your recommendation, precisely what we're trying to do. And I know there's lots of folks on the call that are waiting to hear it clearly articulated. And now it was clearly articulated that on the week of, I think it's, what's next week? October, October, starting October 6th, kindergarten through fifth grade, Meadowbrook, Frenchtown, Hannaford, and Eldridge will come back full in person. So they'll come to school every day unless it's been designated as a professional de development day or otherwise no school on the statewide calendar so should we vote in favor of this uh we should probably make that very clear to everybody in the public and also include the statewide calendar with it as some of those days are gonna creep up on pe people and some folks might confuse the statewide calendar with what we're we've decided to do um and which for me i think we want to make that clear and along those lines i get that all of these things are hard uh, but we're not taking away things we're adhering to our obligation we're all well aware that the state has mandated that we weigh whether we return on five metrics, statewide data, 
municipal readiness, the ability to test uh, sufficient cleaning supplies and operational readiness. We were waiting as we did the staggered approach to ensure that we could meet the operational readiness metric. We have now learned that we can. It's not just a decision we're making whether or not to do it once we met that and so once we do that as far as i'm concerned that's the end of the analysis if that's personally not palatable to me then i have to make personal decisions but as a body that's our obligation in my opinion thank you mr so, so, and before we uh, before we move to um, to act on the superintendent's recommendation, I do want to turn to public comment. We have a couple of hands raised. So, with the permission of the committee, sorry. Uh, Dr. Yeah, I, do. I just want to be clear that um, we don't actually have a vote on the agenda to act. We acted. We acted um, several weeks ago. We voted four to three for the reopening plan, and we approved that, that we would be in full uh, no later than October 14th, and that's what we're doing. And the superintendent has shared with us that that first all-in day for elementary will be October 6th. So there's no vote on the agenda, and we already voted for exactly what the superintendent just said several weeks ago. So, you so, so, so understood. It, just, um, we we do as a, and and that is an approach we could take. Um, we um, you know we are able to act on anything that is on the um, would choose to vote to support the superintendent's recommendation based on the um, the, the the data that we have regarding health and safety, that we are free to do Understood. that. But there would have um, so to that, be a motion that's, that's all, that's, to, okay. Yeah, it, it's really, it's what the pleasure of the group is if we want to make, um, if somebody wants to make a motion to, um, regarding the superintendent's recommendation. I see a couple of other hands up, and then we do have four folks so far in public comments. So um, I'll go to Ms. Misella and then Ms. Powell. Thank you, just briefly. I mean, I, get, I think just to be crystal clear, kind of just, the plains point. Um, I think we should take another vote. I think we should make it crystal clear. I think I don't know that anybody is in a position or the inclination to go against uh, any of the recommendations from statewide, you know, through Mrs. Meyer. But um, you know, I think it would be appropriate to. I'm not prepared to make a motion because I think there's so much this public comment and all of that. But yeah, thank I, you for I, I that. Would, thank yeah. you, Ms. Powell. You need to unmute. I just wanted to add that um, if we decided not to make a motion tonight, uh, that I would support a motion regarding distance learning and our commitment to continue that for anyone who chooses it. And that if we do make another one um, about supporting the recommendation that that is included so that it is very clear that the intention of this district when we go back full is to continue to provide distance learning to anyone that chooses it because we've never actually taken a vote on that so and the state seems to be wavering in its commitment to that at the moment so i just ask that we include that thank you for that uh so i am going to turn to public comment now and um i know that the names that i see do, don't always directly connect to the person who is uh on the other end but i'm going to let you, it is uh peter carney hey good evening you hear me okay yes this is Mr. Carney. It is, yes. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that the, the neighboring town of North Kingstown is back through eighth grade. Um, have we talked to them as a district? Uh, if yes, how is East Greenwich different in the middle school level? And if we haven't, why have we not maybe engaged in the neighboring town on how they're, they've executed middle school students back in the classroom? Thank you for that, Mr. Carney. To respond to that, Ms. Mark. Thank you. Um, yes, we have. I regularly speak with um, Superintendent OJ from North Kingstown. In fact, we meet as the Southern um, Superintendents Group. Um, they, are, they have created stable pods for their students. So the students stay in one classroom all day long. Um, and 
um, with the same students all day long and don't move around from class to class. And, and that's, that's the difference. Thank you, Mrs. Meyer. I'm going to go to uh, Francine Tuzard next. Uh, yes, hi, how are you? Well, Thank uh, you for uh, things. Um, so I just had a question, you know, I'm in total support that we're opening uh, and uh, looking forward to it, but just had a few questions in regards to, so is there going to be it, it, pay, parents that initially chose to go distant learning, will they be have will they have the opportunity to change to go in person i'm just trying to anticipate how many kids are we in are we expecting to be in any class if cohort a and b are together and uh since seems like we're trying to keep the guidelines of the three feet away you know i'm just trying to imagine if this is really possible and uh so if I could ask you to, to ask all of the questions that you have, and then uh, we'll take a moment to uh, to see if Mrs. Meyer can respond. So the, the question is about whether or not parents who have who have chosen distance learning. Uh, can... So I have yeah, probably have two questions. One is, are the parents that initially chose distance learning mm -hmm. able to switch to in person? Would that be allowed? And second, with the cohort of kids that we're going to have in full. Um, We'll, we'll still have to think about like where they're going to be placed or are they going to be placed in each class that we cohorted initially or. Thank so you for your I, think, I think I, I think I can answer that question. Um, when we administered the original survey asking about distance learning or the choice for the type of learning, uh, we said that we would take um, changes to those requests up until the time of school starting and then it would be at the semester break for any changes um, with regard to what would happen if all of our distance learners came back into school we have about I would say three class about the space and not having the three feet and we would have to make some other provision based on that. But generally speaking, you know, 90% of our classrooms with all in will have that four or five feet. Thank you, Mrs. Meyer. And thank you, Ms. Tuzard. I'm going to go to Marcy Sullivan next. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Marcy Sullivan, and I'm um, a career teacher at, in the district. And I currently teach second grade at Meadowbrook. And I wanted to go on public record and share um, a correspondence that I sent to the school committee and um, Mrs. Myers on the 29th, excuse me, on the 27th of this month. Um, it was my understanding at that time that we were going to reassess the existing model and with feedback and data um, make a plan for going forward. So bear with me. As we approach our reassessment of implementation of our 50% hybrid model, I feel it is important to express my observations and concerns with you prior to your next session. I appreciate the remarkable achievements of our administration in preparing for our recent reopening of schools. I am in awe of the astounding and exhaustive effort of our library and media specialists and technology experts to ready our fleet for this adventure. I am impressed by the efforts and supportive attitudes of many of our parents and families to ride the waves of a turbulent sea of changes and adjustments. The bravery and sacrifices of my colleagues to repeatedly attempt to navigate the seemingly impossible uncharted wars each day is depleting and appalling at times. I am proud of our collective adaptability and resi resilience in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although not inherently resistant to moving forward to a 100% model, I expect the public acknowledgement of the health, safety, logistical, and academic ramifications of doing so. The East Greenwich School Department teachers have embraced the district expectations in good faith that the East Greenwich School Committee will follow through on your moral obligation to operate with transparency and provide full disclosure to parents, students, and teachers of our community. 
And the letter begins, um, Dear Superintendent Meyer, Chairwoman Mark, and members of the East Granite School Committee. We, the faculty and staff of Meadowbrook Farm School, pride ourselves on a commitment to providing a safe, high quality, and rich educational experience for students and families. While considering a full in-person model for all students, we urge you to prioritize safety and social emotional well-being for our children, faculty, and staff, and developmentally appropriate learning and teaching practices for the district's youngest, most vulnerable learners. Uh, the first bullet question is, if the East Greenwich School Committee adopts implementation of full in-person school, which specific CDC, OSHA, and RIDO guidelines will be violated? The second bullet is, if the district adopts the full in-person model, how soon thereafter will parents be able to change their child's placement to full distance learning? Um, Meadowbrook Farm School teachers remain highly concerned about the expectation that we are responsible for simultaneously teaching students in the classroom and at home in real time. The reality is that technology malfunctions and limitations are extremely difficult, if not impossible, for parents, caregivers, and teachers of children between ages three and seven years old to manage. These expectations are far from educationally and developmentally appropriate for young children. We continue to have significant concerns related to student, family, and school safe privacy. And another bullet, what plans does the East Grant School Committee have for discussing the assignment of existing teachers to create dedicated full distance learning teachers at each grade level at every school? And then in parentheses, in the absence of a volunteer, could we have the membership vote to follow the seniority list to designate a teacher to become the full DL teacher? How would we address the in-person caseload of that teacher if class size limits have been met? Thank you for your time and consideration of these concerns. And then it was signed by uh, nearly 40 of our staff. And just to um, clarify uh, Ms. Musella's description of the populations that I teach. So in the hybrid model, you were correct that I typically have an AA um, cohort in front of me in person while a BB cohort is at home. And then a third population are the full DL students that never that work remotely all the time and they never come to school. If um, so, so they require. Although I can do synchronous teaching, the fact that I have full DL students who are on my caseload 100% of the time, I need to provide them with distance learning planning that I post to my Google Classroom every day. Mm -hmm. And because of the discrepancies in the logistics of getting through the routines in the classroom, there are significant time lags for which the ch children at home need to be provided a, a DL activity or be instructed to otherwise occupy themselves while the in-school students are being toileted or going to a special or having their um, classroom lunch and recess and so forth. And um, the 70 minutes that it takes for our arrival and dismissal, and that's with half of the population coming in. Um, the fourth population that, that I would have to address would be those that are distance learners due to quarantine. And we know that that will fluctuate. So I just wanna make it clear that Meadowbrook is, is among, I don't know how many specific schools in the district that we don't have equity across the district with regard to full assignment of distance learning teachers at every grade level. So that is why I want it clearly understood that the work demands and obligations of the teachers at these schools that don't have the benefit of a designated DL teacher are having a much different caseload, or excuse me, workload in terms of preparation and assignment and monitoring and engaging and um, um, those creating assignments, modifying them, and so forth for the distance learners. So uh, I do appreciate everybody's effort, and thank you for hearing me out. 
Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We really appreciate the feedback and um, I personally am very uh, grateful that you are in direct communication with Mrs. Meyer and district administration regarding your concerns, um, both on your own accord through the separate letter and also through the, the feedback um, channels that Mrs. Meyer has established um, regarding faculty and staff input. Um, I, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I, you know, I don't think there's a, a seated member of the school committee here that would be comfortable moving forward with um, any plans that were in violation of any of the current regulations. And what we're hearing tonight is that um, in moving forward, we would be able to, um, to, to move forward in a manner that would ensure that we were in compliance, whether it was with the CDC, with the Rhode Island Department of Health, or, or with OSHA. Um, and I think that's a commitment that our district administration has made, and I, I would imagine that every member of the school committee feels very strongly about that as well. Um, I, ho I hope you also heard that we are um, very open to any recommendations from the superintendent um, that would help to support a teacher that would help to support teachers and staff, um, and that would help to support our students. And so as, um, as we expect, our faculty um, and, and union leadership will continue to work closely with district administration. We as a school committee will continue to work closely with Mrs. Meyer on uh, any recommendations that um, she might be looking for us to support. Um, as we continue um, in these uncharted uh, waters. So um, thank you so much. We appreciate, uh, appreciate your input um, before tonight and, uh, and for sharing it this evening as well. Thank so um, I'm gonna go to Elizabeth Kenworthy next. Welcome. You are unmuted, but we can't quite hear you yet. I think we have you now. You do? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, um, good evening, everybody. My daughter, who's a student in the district, has actually prepared a statement to read tonight. Oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Tamsin Kenworthy. I'm in fifth grade at Hannaford School and I live at 131 Blueberry Drive. I have many opinions on the way we are learning this year. I'm very glad to hear that Mrs. Meyer is recommending going back to school five days a week. In both places where my mom and dad work, their elementary schools are going back five days a week. As a person who loves school, I have had a lot of trouble with distance learning and I, lo and I love my teacher a lot. I would very I very much prefer to go to school five days a week to see my teacher more. From my experience in the past two weeks, it has been a lot easier for me to do my work at school rather than in my home. Thank you for listening and I hope you take what I said and consider it. Thank you so much. We, it's, it's such a joy for us to hear directly from our students and you did a great job. So thank you for that. All right, I'm gonna to go to uh, Kara Radian next. Mrs. Radigan, did we lose you? I think perhaps you lowered your hand. If you did not intend to, you can raise it again, but I'm gonna go ahead and move to Donna McPhee. Welcome. You'll just need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Tonight, <laughs> um, tonight, you've already heard about the challenges faced and incredible efforts made as the school year has begun. To say that technology has been a challenge is an understatement. But with that said, we appreciate the administration's efforts to continue to make improvements and to acquire new technology to provide us with tools necessary to teach in this new manner. But the challenges in this area do continue. Additionally, teaching two groups at the same time is at best difficult and at times seemingly impossible. Teachers, teachers feel torn between the groups and giving each what they need to be successful. We are rising to the challenge and we will continue to do so. But it is and has taken a toll on teachers who are working the equivalent of multiple jobs to give our best to the students of East Greenwich. As far as going back all in at the elementary level, 
Based on conversations and the emails I've received, teachers have strong and varied opinions about this recommendation. Some teachers prefer to go to be all in. Others would like to move to complete distance learning. Most that I've heard from don't like the partial model we are in now, but realize that it does reduce the numbers for health and safety. Even if we go back all in, as you've heard, some classes will still have distance learners and these teachers will continue to be challenged to meet the needs of two groups, and in some cases, more groups. Ideally, it would be preferable to have designated distance learning teachers to truly give these students what they need to do their best learning. And I think Anne's point tonight about keeping asynchronous Mondays for elementary teachers as we go all in to support teachers is a good idea to support teachers in the evolving situation. I continue to appreciate the collaboration between administration, the leadership of the EGEA, and teachers in the district. We want to thank students and families for their patience as we work our way through this year. We, can, we will continue to work together to problem solve and endeavor to provide the best possible education for the students and families in East Greenwich as we face this unprecedented time together. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McVeigh. We appreciate your comments. Ms. Misala, and then Ms. Powell. Uh, thanks for that. I really appreciate all the public comment um, a lot. First, I just want to make it very clear um, that I'm not advocating to keep Mondays as asynchronous days. I am raising the issue um, of taking away professional development opportunities for our kids. So I'm raising the issue. I just want to be clear. We uh, um, have been provided, Mrs. Meyer has provided us um, with uh, spreadsheets from the elementary schools that show um, really the number of kids per classroom in an all-in scenario based on showing that with, and again, I don't have it in front of me, but it, you know, if we've got um, 18 kids in a classroom, then that's mostly four to six feet apart in this particular classroom. And we've received those breakdowns for each elementary school. And I think that part of it, in the interest of transparency, that's something that we should make publicly available. We should make that document available, but make it not an evolving Google sheet that can be edited, freeze it in a moment in time tonight, uh, just so that it's clear if we do make a decision on it at this moment in time. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it. I, you know, I, it's, um, we hear a lot of anecdotal stuff. We hear a lot of uh, concerning things. I, never mind. I'm just. Uh, I, I still have concerns that um, we need to support our distance learners. We need to support our teachers, and I'm just really concerned that if we go all in, um, that will satisfy the majority of the parents. Certainly, most of the ones who have advocated so strongly. Um, but but I'm concerned about all of that. And I, I just, I, I'm sure we will continue to follow up rigorously, certainly at school committee meetings. Um, we have an opportunity here to do things differently in a way that we can sustain over the long term post COVID, as several of us have mentioned um, throughout the last you know, few months um, in these and other meetings. So I hope we take advantage of that. I hope we can think out of the box enough to take advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Um, yes, so just following up on that, I was going to say that I wasn't sure that Ms. Michelle was in fact advocating, but supporting any recommendation that Mrs. Meyer or the district had that would allow teachers to offer the best educational experience and to, you know, add my support there as well. If that wasn't already clear that, you know, I know there is a lot of advocacy for a certain way of doing things in a certain in way of returning to school um, and there are metrics and we're used to doing it one way but as we're reminded over and again you know our real obligation is to provide an education as laid out in an education plan and if there there may be different ways to do that now and that we should look at all of them and and support whatever we think is the best way to do that whatever it may be um, so and and distance learning and to make sure that that is something we're constantly reassessing. I know we've talked tonight about possibly not taking another 
vote because we had an action in place and uh, whether or not we do that um, so that we have another week before our supports in place, whether it's technical support, whether it's administrative support, whether it's looking at the calendar, whether it's, um, you know, requesting a joint meeting so that we can ask for further resources if it means making hires. I don't know what that that is, but um, I really do think it, I am also concerned, obviously, about distance learning and want to make sure that that does not fall through the cracks and that any action we take is very specific about that um, and that that's part of what we're looking at. Thank you for that. And again, I'm open to whatever the pleasure of the committee is. I mean, um, you know, from my perspective, having established that we will be able to meet health and safety guidelines, um, I would be open to um, entertaining a, 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 you know, a motion to support the superintendent's recommendation to um, starting next week, um, except for Monday, which will be an asynchronous day to move to full in-person learning for, um, for our elementary school students. I think we can, um, we can add to that, that obviously we will be monitoring um, the, the, the implementation of the full in-person uh, with an expectation that the superintendent will come to the school committee if there are any uh, decisions that need to be made to help support both our learners and our teachers. Um, so again, it, I, I leave it to the pleasure of the group if somebody would like to, uh, to, to make a motion regarding the superintendent's recommendation. I think there's a risk that based on our conversation, the public may be confused. Uh, perhaps not a great risk, but I agree with Dr. McKeon. We don't need it because we already voted to do this into phase in full in person uh, by the governor's mandated date, which I think is October 13th or 14th. But in the interest of clarity and publicizing to the community precisely when we, we are scheduled to do this, I'll make a motion to support the superintendent's recommendation to return to full in-person learning for the pre-K through fifth grade students, Meadowbrook, Frenchtown, Hanford, and Eldridge beginning October 6th and thereafter adhering to the statewide calendar and having in-person school for those elementary school students each and every day on the statewide calendar. Thank you for that, Mr. Plain. Is there a second? Mr. Dronzek? Yeah, Discussion? I just want to be absolutely sure that our state, the statewide calendar, which had all of those um, professional development days, is in fact in alignment with ours. We might just have to say our the state and district. Unless it's in complete agreement, then we leave it as is. Mrs. Meyer? Our calendar is a statewide calendar with added quarter dates. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Misella? Uh, I, I, I am in support of the motion, except for the very last part, with keeping them in every single day, because there could be some other emergency that could arise. We could have a spike in COVID. So I would just, I would prefer that that language get altered or taken off altogether, um, you know, altered to say something like, you know, as, as long as, while permitted by the state or something like that. I don't want to say we're, we're in, we're voting all in. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And the superintendent has the not only the, the um, ability, but the obligation to direct the closing of schools in certain circumstances. We all remember something of the past no days. Uh, okay. We don't have to put in our normal calendar that we're going to have this 180 day schedule, unless it snows, uh, we just have the calendar. And if an emergency arises, we don't have school. But if that's fine, I think that helps make it. And it is consistent also with uh, policy that we, I believe, adopted that, that empowers the superintendent to tell. Yes. Um, just as I stated before, I would feel more comfortable with the motion if we explicitly stated something about the choice of distance learning. I don't know if that goes in this motion or, or if that is a separate motion that we are going to offer that. Um, but I think it's 
I think it's important because it's not implicit. Um, it's definitely not part of our status quo. It's not anything we've ever done before. And if suddenly, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that that is something we should add when we're talking about this so that it is clear, that it is clear. I've had lots of questions, you know, if the hybrid is gone, can people still do distance learning? I mean, that is, that is a concern. And so I think we should add that language. Thank you for that. So I, I defer to, to Mr. Plain. If you'd like to add that to the existing motion, we can act on, on the motion that's on the table. And then Ms. Powell can offer something moving forward. That would be fine too. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. So add, to add to the motion that you've already stated, some language regarding our continued to commitment to provide a high quality experience to our distance learners. Yeah, thank you for, yeah, that sounds good. All right. I'm going to check in with our clerk, Ms. Deniglio. Do you feel like you have the language of the motion? Do you want to read it back to us? I think it's just the last sentence that I need. After we, after we decided on while permitted by the state. Just the last sentence for the high quality learners for distance learning, if you could just repeat that. Oh, what I just said. Um, yeah. So, um, and, and that the district will continue its commitment to provide a high quality education to our distance learners. To any student that chooses it? To any student that chooses to distance learn. In, yeah. Yeah. In this, yeah. During this, the year of this pandemic. Mrs. Demeglia, do you feel like you have it now? Yes, I'm all set. All right. Is there any can, additional discussion? Can Ms. we have Paula? the motion restate? Can we have the motion restated? Sure. Ms. Demeglia, would you please read it back to us? Um, Mr. Plain made a motion to support the super, superintendent's recommendation to return to an all, all in person learning for students pre K to five at Meadowbrook. Frenchtown, Hannaford, Eldridge to begin October 6th and thereafter to adhere to the statewide calendar and have in-person school for those elementary students while permitted by the state. And then I have your last sentence about the district learning. The district will continue its commitment for high quality learners um, for those who apply for distance learning during the pandemic. For those who choose distance learning during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for restating the motion. Um, so is there any additional discussion? All those in favor, roll call vote. Allison Powell? Aye. Amy Sellum? Aye. Carolyn Mark? Aye. Jean Quinn? Aye. Jeff Tronzek? Aye. Lori McEwen? Aye. Matt Plain? Aye. The ayes have it. Um, I know that the district will make every effort to communicate this decision um, uh, as, as, uh, as comprehensively as we possibly can uh, using every outlet available to us uh, because we are talking about a change in schedule that is just one week out. Um, but thank you everybody for all of the collaboration that it took to get us to this moment. Um, and I look forward to uh, continued updates as to how things are going. And again, just um, welcome uh, Superintendent Meyer, any additional recommendations that you might like to bring before us that would enable us as a school committee to be able to support our learners and to be able to support our teachers. So we look forward to continuing to work with you on that. So thank you all for that. Um, see you thing. Um, and this is regarding, um, maintenance of effort. Uh, the town council is actually meeting as we speak. Um, we, we, we normally don't conflict what would have been their normal meeting date of last night to tonight. Um, so what we know is that they are currently discussing a, um, a potential resolution regarding emergency maintenance of effort legislation. It's my understanding that it's just on as a discussion action on it. Uh, but as members of the school committee have been communicated with um, from the town, by the town manager, we wanted to put this discussion item on our agenda tonight so that we could bring it into the public forum um, to, um, to update everybody as to what the discussion will vario to 
um, to look into what this proposed legislation would do. And I've asked him to provide a briefing to the to the committee and also to the to the sure. full community. Well, to be so, clear, there Council is Alberio. no proposed legislation before anybody. The only thing that's up for discussion before the town council is a resolution. And the way it was explained to me is to <clears throat> going forward to the extent that the municipality, but uh, East Greenwich and municipalities around the state are asked to uh, essentially provide additional funding to meet COVID related expenses that in the future, the, that um, allocation of monies um, should not be counted toward maintenance of effort in the future. And as you know, um, there's a, a couple statutory provisions that address maintenance of effort, 16723 and 16724 under Rhode Island general laws. And what does that mean, maintenance of effort? For the benefit of, of um, the public, the um, town council, the municipality is obligated to fund the schools at the same level in the preceding years, but for some exceptions like Medicaid reimbursement, that sort of thing, or unless there's a decline in the um, enrollment. But for the sake of this discussion, and let's assume that, that uh, they have to fund us. It's, it's level funding. You, you have to provide the same level of funding, 100% of what you provided in the preceding year. This past fiscal year, uh, we got a bump of 2.89%. So anticipating or not knowing whether the municipality is going to be reimbursed for COVID-related expenses, obviously our a school district incurred additional expenses. So that gets the attention of the municipality because you, we're going to be seeking additional funding, whether it's through the federal government or the allocations that the, gov the governor has from uh, the federal government. We don't know how that's all going to work out through reimbursement. So I think the town council wanted to open a discussion now that we're coming up the budget season, what do we do if we have to cover these expenses? They should be exempt from the maintenance of effort requirement. About two minutes before this meeting started, and it's, it's very general, very generic. Uh, it, it uses broad language. It doesn't have uh, specificity to the resolution, um, but I would I would ask that each of you probably review it. Um, we can we could have a discussion with um, Mr. Nada and members of the um, town council at some point before this is adopted to just get their input as to you know how they perceive this would would work. Yeah. The way I read the resolution, it would be to, in the future, perhaps uh, encourage uh, the municipalities to uh, and and the local officials to come up with some legislation that would exempt from the maintenance of effort obligation COVID-related expenses. So that's how I see things. Great, thank you for that. So I'm going to open it up to members of the committee if you have any. Any comments or questions about this, Ms. Powell? So um, I just wanted to be clear, you know, with this resolution and having read it, and I know we've seen a memo from um, Mr. Nada regarding this. Just being clear that, you know, we have had quite a substantial amount of COVID-related expenses so far that, that the district has incurred, but we have not been given any so and just um just to be clear that we still may but that the clock on the maintenance of effort uh waiver would start now um because so far we haven't everything we've spent we've managed to find we've looked in our capital mm -hmm. reserves we've looked to our bond funds we've looked to our 
fund balance. We've taken money from other areas of the budget that we thought we might not have to spend because of a reduced season or a reduced school year or reduced transportation. Um, it's always part of our actual budget. And even the supplemental so, you know, that we got wasn't really a supplemental because we got it before all the budgets closed. So that is our budget. So that even though we might be reimbursed for some of the COVID expenses we've already incurred, that none of that should count towards this maintenance of effort waiver for COVID expenses, because this is not extra. This is our budget. And I just wanted that to be very clear. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's my understanding, and 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 uh, counselor, correct me if if I'm wrong, but this is this is my understanding of it was that it was really targeted at additional supplemental requests that were COVID related. Yeah, um, that, that, which, that's what the email suggested. Which that's is which that. is understandable if these are not expenses that we are going to continue to incur. You know, right. it's rational to see why it should not be counted yeah. toward our maintenance of effort. We, you know, my only concern right. is nobody knows how long this pandemic is going to That's continue. That's right. I, I think and, it's anticipated. Yeah, on, on, under the statutory expenditures, they're, they're taken out of the MOE formula. So you're right, it's for supplemental requests, and, and we just don't know. I think it's, it's only, um, I think it's the principle. So that, that the exposure isn't unlimited. Thanks, um, Thanks. I, I have not uh, seen the proposed resolution, um, so I'm looking forward to that. I appreciate the spirit. Um, with them to just propose because I would like to think, thinking optimistically, that this is a way that town council and the town manager can see, uh, make it easier on them to give us a supplemental appropriation, considering that they have to think, you know, years down the line, and and everybody is is difficult, uh, and I look forward to. I think in particular, this kind of stuff, there does need to be at least a meeting where we really discuss all of this, and we really do have to uh, acknowledge the that we should but that we should take in order to just you get to this point today, uh, to early um, services uh, and then a lot of. A lot of things. So, um, thank you. And I do think that that's exactly right, Ms. Musella, that um, their contemplation of this is really um, coming from a place of looking to be prepared and it has never no appropriation because our state falls short. But whatever, um, it really does seem like that's the spirit in which it is. Yes, considering this, and I think if we had had their meeting tonight simultaneous with ours, um, that Mr. Minata probably would have been here in person on our uh, call. And given the, the kind of uh, atmosphere of cooperation and goodwill that's currently being the school committee and the council, I'm comfortable with this sort of thing. And I think it's actually a good idea, as Ms. Celebrated, in the right? Because we're that um, this will allow us to plan more. Uh, so, you know, it's making decisions based on saying oh, we'll have to care this year, but you know, next year. Next year. Yes. Yes.
Uh, our last agenda item, school committee suggestion for agenda item. Does anybody have any on top of mind? Um, I would Stella? like to have a separate report, a succinct report, given docus or as part of these report. Specifically, where we are at the IP meetings. Some of the students have Anybody have anything else? All right, we'll first reach out to you, Ms. Meyer, if you can give any intern to the budget plan. Dr. Taylor, thank you. It's a favorable. Well, Hi. And Michelle. Hi. 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 Lori McEwen. Uh -oh. Matt Plain. Hi. Um, I, 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 I thought we are 